In our fallen human condition, we are often tempted to take responsibility for our own salvation. We say, I accepted Christ. I chose to follow him. Well, today on Truth For Life, Alistair Begg reminds us that we are saved by God's grace alone. He is the one who drew us to himself and to believe. As we embrace the reality of God's sovereignty, we begin to experience his grace and peace. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Amen. Well, the verses to which I should like to draw your attention are verses 7, 8, 9, and 10. In these six chapters, which make up Paul's letter to the Ephesians, we have, as we observed last Sunday morning, the distilled essence of the Christian faith. The opening chapter, particularly up and through verse 14, is essentially a doxology. Paul is just almost running away with himself, as in one elongated sentence without punctuation in the Greek— He extols the wonder of God's amazing love and provides us with, as someone has said, a symphony of salvation. In fact, as we have read it, both here and presumably on our own, it will be apparent to us that it almost defies our ability to structure it. It's uh, possible always to lay down some kind of structured outline on the text, and often as preachers we spend more time on that than we should. But there are times also where we just have to allow ourselves, if you like, to be swept along in the current of the text itself. And I think here in Ephesians 1 we're in one of these places. In terms of the totality of the letter, uh, one of my friends sent me a text very early this morning from Scotland saying, how about this for an outline of Ephesians? Uh, You have the wealth of the church in the first three chapters. You have the walk of the church in terms of its responsibilities. And then you have the warfare of the church when you get to chapter 6. And I thought that was jolly helpful. Uh, We could even summarize that. And in the first three chapters, we have the wealth that is ours in Christ. And in chapters 4, 5, and 6, we are then um, confronted with the work that we are called to do for Christ. Certainly, as we saw last time, the first three chapters provide us with the nature of our belief, and chapters 4, 5, and 6 with the responsibility of our behavior. We noted last time that that order is very important. We referred to it as the grammar of the gospel, that the indicatives come before the imperatives, and that everything that Paul is calling his readers to do is dependent upon everything he tells us God has already done. That is a vitally important principle, not only in Ephesians, but throughout the whole grammar of the gospel— It is on the strength of what God has accomplished in Christ that he then calls us to become actually what we are. Last Sunday evening, we found ourselves in verses 3, 4, 5, and 6, essentially swept up, caught up in the wonder of God's electing love. And as we spent 
sometime on the doctrine of election and predestination, uh, we reminded ourselves that this is a biblical doctrine, that this is not something that was invented by Augustine or by Calvin, but rather it is that which we find as we turn to the Bible together. And we began last Sunday evening to see that all God gives us, He gives us in the Lord Jesus Christ, and all that He does for us, He does for us in Christ. And if you allow yourself just to scan the verses before you, you will see that this is a recurring emphasis on the part of Paul. Uh, A famous book on Paul uh, is entitled, A Man in Christ. And uh, Paul was amazed Uh, that he had been placed into Christ. And that comes across in all of his writings, and supremely so here in these opening verses of Ephesians. We sang last Sunday evening, and I think uh, with a great sense of uh, joy, loved before the dawn of time, uh, chosen by my Maker, hidden in my Savior. I am His, and He is mine, cherished for eternity. In fact, those truths are so important that if you missed last Sunday evening's study, then you may like to go online and pick it up there, because it is of essential importance that you and we together understand the biblical emphasis on God's initiative in our salvation. The biblical emphasis on God's initiative in our salvation. Think about it. How does a person actually become a Christian? What is involved? How can a person actually know God? How can someone say that they know God? Who is God? What is God? How is God to be known? Now, the Reformers, Calvin and Luther in particular, did us a great service by pointing out the way in which the God who is in one sense hidden in His essential being— made himself or disclosed himself, placed himself within the orb of our ability to lay hold upon him. Both of them pointed out that God, in his essential being, is beyond the realm of our natural experience and is beyond the realm of our speculative logic. All right? So, in other words, God is not known by looking inside of ourselves, as is a contemporary view in the spiritualities of our day. God, whatever He is, is included in nature, is part of nature. We are part of nature. Therefore, if we will look inside of ourselves, we will somehow or another be able to meet Him. Not so, says the Bible. No, says somebody else. That's not how you do it. It's not experiential. It is simply investigative. If you are clever enough and try hard enough, and you are logical enough, you will finally be able to meet God. But in actual fact, there is no intellectual road to a knowledge of God. Don't misunderstand. That doesn't mean that if you're an intellectual, you will never meet God. It simply means that whether you're an intellectual or, like me, a dummy, you will meet God in the exact same way and at the exact same place because in his essential being he is not known in those ways, but he is actually known not by speculation, but by revelation, the disclosure of himself. And he has made himself known through his Word written, the Bible, and through his Word living, his Son. Therefore, if anyone is ever to come to a knowledge of God, to a saving knowledge of God, it will be down those two pathways. It will involve discovering God in His Word and in His Son. In fact, it is indispensable that that is the case if we are to come to know Him. Uh, David Wells, who is uh, wonderful at this kind of thing, has a purple passage along these lines in one of his books that I want to read to you. It's fairly brief, but it is wonderful. He writes, There is an invisible boundary between God and ourselves, both with his being and with respect to what we know. We cannot cross the boundary to know him savingly. He is not found in our deepest self. He is outside the range of our intuitive radar. 
we are, in fact, alienated from him and shut out from his fellowship and knowledge. We cannot access him on our own terms or in our own time. No, it is he who must cross the boundary if we are to know him. And this he has done. Finish the sentence. In Christ. And this he has done in Christ. Now, it was for that reason that last Sunday night, before we thought about the wonder of God's electing love, we said, let's make sure that we realize that of all the things that God does by means of his prevenient grace, the one thing that he doesn't do for us is believe for us. We must believe. And I took a moment to do what I'm going to do again now because, as I say, the vast majority were not present to think this out. And and we simply rehearsed the way in which—and this is not a mechanism, this is simply an observation—the way in which these constituent elements will be involved in some way in a person coming to a knowledge of God. First, that is the truth of the good news of God crossing the boundary in the person of Christ. As the good news of the gospel, as that truth is presented, the Holy Spirit convinces us of its truth. All right? So, in other words, we are brought along to some event like this. We are interested or disinterested bystanders. Uh, We are not impressed with this. We didn't like that, and so on. But somewhere along the line, as the Bible is being taught, there's like a knock at the the back of our hearts or at the back of our heads. And, And just this little note is sounded. And it is the sounding note of the Holy Spirit who says, you know what? This stuff is true. At the same time, if God is at work, the truths of the gospel, when they are recognized— then become applied to ourselves. So, we don't simply say, oh, well, this is a very interesting religious notion about uh, salvation, and I'm sure it is very helpful to somebody and probably to some who are here today. But no, it goes beyond that. All of a sudden, now we find ourselves saying, "Uh, this actually refers to me. Then, when we are convinced of our sin— the Holy Spirit makes it clear to us that the only remedy for it is in the person and work of Jesus. In trusting that, the result is that our faith then rests not on the wisdom of man, but in the power of God, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians. And then when we tell others about it, that the God God has reached into our hearts and saved us, we are able to tell them that he has done this entirely without any reference to our merits. Because many of our friends will say, oh, well, what what was it that you did? Or uh, how how did you achieve that? Or uh, how did you make yourself a Christian? You have to, if, if you are a Christian, you know you didn't make yourself a Christian. You know that you were made one. Not against your will but your will suddenly was constrained. And then when you read, for example, he predestined us, verse 5, for adoption as his sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the Beloved, you say to yourself, that's exactly it. I don't understand the depth of it all, but I do know this, that I have been numbered in his family, and I have been granted the privileges of of being a son of God, and this has been given to me. Notice the final phrase of verse 6, in the beloved, in the beloved. In other words, there there is no knowledge of this apart from being in the beloved, apart from being in Christ. If if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. If anyone remains outside of Christ, he is not a new creation. There's an inherent logic in this. And it is in the Beloved. Who's the Beloved? The Beloved is the Lord Jesus. Jesus steps forward to be baptized by John, and the voice pierces the heavens and says, "'This is my Beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased.'" 
Jesus goes on the Mount of Transfiguration, and again the voice from heaven, the voice of the Father, this is my beloved Son. Listen to him. The love of the Father for the Son from all of eternity is beyond our ability to comprehend which is what makes it so staggering when you hear Jesus praying, John 17, in his high priestly prayer, and he's praying to the Father that that those who are his followers may be one, even as he and the Father are one. And then he goes on to say, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. The love of God for you, if you are a believer— is the same as the love that he had from all of eternity for his Son. That is the extent of it. That is the vastness of it. That is the incomprehensible nature of it. And some of you are here this morning, you say, I don't know that anybody loves me. I don't know that I'm loved in my earthly father, or whatever it might be. Life breaks down like that. We understand that. But if you are in Christ, you are loved with an everlasting love. You're led by grace, that love to know. The Spirit breathing from above. He has taught us this is so. This is the wonder of it. And in verses 3 to 6, we looked at how it is stated so clearly that the believer has been chosen by God the Father beginning in verse 7 and through essentially verse 12, uh, Paul is explaining how we are redeemed by the work of the Son. And in verse 7, you will notice it begins again, in him we have redemption. And this seventh verse is really, I could say, the heart of the gospel, the heart of the gospel. If you turn just for a moment to Exodus chapter 6, hear the picture— is of being set free by uh, the paying of a price. And in Exodus chapter 6, uh, verse 5, I have heard, says God, the groaning of the people of Israel whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm— and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. And you will remember how God then uh, institutes the Passover and uh, instructs uh, his people to ensure that they take a lamb without blemish, and that they kill that lamb— and that they take the blood from that lamb, and they mark the lintels and the doorposts of their home, so that when the angel of death passes through in God's inevitable judgment, he will pass over the firstborn in that home who will live because the lamb has died. And the work of God in redeeming his people out of the bondage of Egypt and the slavery that was theirs in Pharaoh is pointing forward eventually to the great work of redemption to which Paul now refers. He says that which was foreshadowed in the release of the people from Egypt has now been brought to its great fruition in the work of Christ upon the cross. They were enslaved to Pharaoh, but we are enslaved to Satan— to sin, and to death. And what has happened, says Paul, is that Christ has justly purchased us back to God, and he has done so at the cost of the shedding of his own blood. You remember when when John the Baptist sees Jesus on the other side of the valley, he says to his followers, if you look over here, behold the Lamb of God who bears away the sin of the world. In other words, Jesus is the great Passover lamb. Now, I'm not going to work this all the way through, but let me just give you one other thought in relationship to this. In in Luke chapter 9, Jesus is there on the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter and John. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. What did he accomplish at Jerusalem? 
He bridged the gap, penetrated the barrier, bore the punishment, bore the wrath of God, took the judgment that sinners deserve, fulfilled what he had said. You see, it was here that redemption was accomplished. And it is in a moment of time that that redemption, which has been accomplished once and for all, is then applied in the life of the believer. You see, Christ didn't come to tell us what we have to do to make ourselves Christians. We can't make ourselves Christians. He came to act on our behalf. And so when you look on the cross, you realize that the forgiveness that is offered is free to us, but it is costly to God. That Christ on the cross absorbs the judgment of God. God's character is such that in his holiness, sin must be judged. In the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ provides in himself the Lamb. And in the cross, he bears the punishment that rightly falls on sin. The Riches of His Grace. That's the title of our message from Alistair Begg. You're listening to Truth For Life. Maybe today you understood the beauty of the gospel for the very first time. You're feeling the Holy Spirit pulling you to respond. If that's the case, we'd love to help you on your journey to help you learn more. Visit truthforlife.org slash the story. There's a short video presentation there and links to other resources that are available. At Truth For Life, we teach the Bible every day because we know that when the Word of God is heard, the Spirit of God works to transform the lives of those who listen. And thanks to the men and women who prayerfully and generously come alongside us, we're grateful to be able to offer all of the teaching from Truth For Life at no cost online and through our mobile app. If you're among those who make Truth For Life possible for others, we want to offer you our sincere thanks. In fact, to show our gratitude today, when you give, you're invited to request a brand new release written by Alistair's good friend, Sinclair Ferguson. This is a five-week-long devotional for Lent titled, To Seek and to Save. Have you ever wondered what it would have been like to be on the road with Jesus and his disciples as they moved toward the most pivotal point in all of human history, the cross and the resurrection? To Seek and to Save invites us to come along on that journey. Jesus met many people during his final days on earth. All of them had needs. This collection of brief daily readings looks closely at those remarkable encounters, reminding us of the wonder of Christ's love and his call to follow him. Request your copy today so you can receive it in time for the first day of Lent next week. Go to truthforlife.org slash donate or call 888-588-7884. Now, before we wrap up, I want to extend a unique invitation to you. This summer, Alistair will be teaching the Bible on board a cruise ship that departs out of Seattle, Washington on August 30th. The Holland America luxury liner will make its way through the deep blue water of the northern Pacific, offering spectacular views of Alaska's coastline, enjoying snow-capped mountains, the Tongass Forest, the historic frontier towns. You'll enjoy seeing God's world as you study God's Word with Alistair and singing worship and praise with musicians Laura Story and Michael O'Brien. Don't miss this memorable adventure. Go online to reserve your ticket at deeperfaithcruise.com or by calling 855-565-5519. I'm Bob Lapine, inviting you to listen tomorrow as we continue studying the riches of God's undeserved grace. This daily program features the Bible teaching of Alistair Begg, and it's furnished by Truth For Life. where the learning is for living.